the founder and CEO of, of the new site, Rappler, the journalist, author, and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Reza, directly from the airport and ready to talk to us about truth and trust and how technology is affecting our rights to freedom of information. Please give her a warm welcome, Maria Reza. Okay, Maria, I just we're all yours. <laughs> Hi! Uh, when Ingvil was introducing me, I was like, oh my god, that's me, I'm speaking. Can I get a clicker? Is that... Um, oh, I forgot to ask. So, um, let me riff, I see it, I see it here. Thank you, wonderful. I really literally just got off the plane. Um, that is what the Nobel has done. Um, oh, so look, from what I have heard, uh, how wonderful to be in the room with you and to be back. This is my third time back in Oslo since December, so I am thrilled to be here and to be in the Peace Institute. Um, I'll quickly, 10 minutes, talk about courage. And part of it is because it sounds like the day so far has been not just telling each other what the problems are, because we certainly know what they are, we're living through it, but. Um, hopefully going to, what are we going to do, right? That's what I hope to get to. And, um, and here's the thing. I just put in my, my book last night at midnight. Graphics, galleys, it went in. So I have five lessons from it. So where are we with courage? Well, look, the last time at the Nobel lecture, I talked about a person-to-person -person defense of our democracy, right? Because what are we dealing with? It's death by a thousand cuts. And you think about that in terms of states, but it is also very personal to everyone in this room. It's death by a thousand cuts of your hopes, your dreams, your integrity, right? So, so kind of look at it that way with me, micro, macro. And when that happens to you, it's happened to me, uh, you just have to like bust through it. And I see Peter in the back. Hi, Peter. Uh, you know, you bust through it, and that's the, I come out of it with this thing of embrace your fear. Whatever it is you're most afraid of, you have to touch it, hold it, i.e. think that the world is going to turn fascist. And what are we going to do? It's much harder when it happens. It's easier right when we're on the precipice, which is where we are right now. Um, if we go, I just got the report from VDEM, you know, if we go by where we are, which is there are less democracies in the world today, we're back at 1989 uh, numbers. If we, you have, just have to look at the Philippines. We had presidential elections on May 9th this year, and there is no better example of the impact of disinformation and our kind of crazy information ecosystem when we watched history change in front of our eyes, right? There are 30 two elections this year. Uh, Kenya just finished, you have Brazil coming up, and it is the same existential problem. You're seeing a kind of stop the steal meta-narrative being seeded on social media. Uh, if we follow the trend, so we have Brazil in October, the US midterms in November, next year you have Africa nations, you have Turkey, by 2024, we have Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population. You have India, the world's largest democracy, and then the US presidential elections. If we follow the trend that we're at and we don't do something now, I think 2024 will be the year we fall off the cliff. That will be the end of democracy. We will have elected enough illiberal leaders that the geopolitical balance of power will shift and democracy will die. I said I would be hopeful, right? <laughs> so at least we know the problem, right? So we embrace our fear, what are we gonna do? Well, every person in this room is very powerful, so I'm gonna ask you for your courage because that will determine our future. Uh, so here's my update. Ingvil asked me to just quickly tell you what's happened to us since then. Well, and this leads to our, our second panel, 
the attacks online have increased. So it's not just information operations on social media, it's not just information warfare on social media, it is also like quick things, death by a thousand cuts, distributed denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks, you guys familiar with that, right? Because it started with the Nobel stream um, in December from Oslo to Manila. So the Nobel Foundation said that the, that, that stream was targeted uh, on that day. But then I went home and all the media organizations, the news organizations in the Philippines were attacked all together. And then it just got worse. We found like this hacker group that was mounting attacks against the major Philippine news outlets. And then our government praised them. That's the upside down world, we're welcome, right? And then we went, we dug deeper with a Swedish group. We found that there was one man in Davao City who was at the core of it. Davao City is where President, former President Duterte, that's his home base. So we found this guy. Once we talked to him, the DDoS attack stopped. But then we looked at where they were recruiting people and it was on Facebook. So Facebook took him down. Hi, Khadija. Uh, that's, the, that's the first, DDoS attacks. The second is that they didn't just come frontally. They came in the back end. So check your websites. Guys, who knows what a black hat SEO attacks are? Yeah, you got to know. Yay. <laughs> black hat SEO attacks, meaning they take junk links to AI-generated stuff. Some of them on easily, like these are sites that Google could do something about and has, I hope. But what this means is it sends death by a thousand cuts, tens of thousands of junk links to your website, in our case, to Philippine news groups. So we as an industry were under attack. And when we looked at it, you have to like physically actually um, annul these links, tens of thousands. Right? So it takes your time. It just takes time, time and time. And we weren't the only ones. All the news organizations, what this means is you have less people finding your site, less people finding the news. So this was something, I stopped working for Rappler. I just, we just started telling our, all the Philippine news organizations how they were being insidiously attacked behind the scenes. And guess what? One of the largest ones was a commercial black hat SEO operator from Sweden. And that company not only like attacks you with tens of thousands, but then asks you to pay them to take it down. So it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> we'll <laughs> Here's the third one. So anyway, if that's happening to new sites in the Philippines, it's got to be happening to others, right? It just takes a while to find that death by a thousand cuts on the back end. Um, this is the third thing, the third and last update of what happened. It's the weaponization of the law. Um, in January this year, we had a dozen cyber libel complaints, right? You know I have seven existing criminal cases now. Rappler has eight, but uh, in order to be here, I have to ask for court permission. Norway and the Nobel always gets me court permission. Thank you. Um, but here's what happened after I got back. We had these complaints. They're cyber libel complaints. Kibaloy is the pastor of former President Duterte. He's also wanted by the FBI for sex trafficking. His site, is kind of like a pseudo news site that is the fastest growing, attacks all the news groups in the Philippines. Um, and they have just been awarded a franchise. The ABS, one of the franchises of ABS-CBNs was given to them. Well, so here's what happened. We had that. And then we found out that, you know, will our justice system work? So it was thrown out. The first seven were thrown out by April. But also in April, we found out that, you know, there were more that we didn't even know about because this is death by a thousand cuts, right? There were cases that were filed in different remote provinces of the Philippines, and we had to take time to respond to those. Uh, otherwise, you get an arrest warrant because cyber libel, as you know, is criminal in the Philippines, right? Well, by April, we actually had 16 more complaints and 50 counts of cyber libel. This is really just to harass you, right? So that you, you take your eye off the ball. Well, here's the best part. All of them have been thrown out. 
all, including the one in Davao City. So you see, there's hope. <laughs> it's, um, but then that wasn't enough, you know, around, uh, when was this? And the end of June, uh, the Philippines reiterated, we lost, we lost at the SEC again. Uh, in April, well, around, I guess this would have been June, we were told that we needed to shut down. That's another one of those moments. Um, and I was like, no, you're going to have, I can't say this because you're, you're watching Philippines. <laughs> so, um, but we decided to keep going because we're not violating anything in the Constitution. So, so every day we go to work and we're not sure whether we will get shut down that day. And at the same time, because we're doing well, I'm trying to recruit people to a company that may or may not get shut down. It's kind of a strange place to be. Um, and then, of course, this is the last thing that happened. It's really slow. July, um, I lost, my colleague and I lost the, the appeal at the Court of Appeals on cyber libel. And then the decision added more jail time. <laughs> You know, it's, you have to laugh. You have to laugh. <laughs> um, so that's my update for you, right? More attacks, more insidious death by a thousand cuts attacks online. More attacks, death by a thousand cuts. I mean, that's like more cases this year than I've had in the last six years. But there's an upside to it. Most of them have been thrown out. The ones that have progressed, it means we're going to be arguing this at the Supreme Court. It means it's a very high stakes game of chicken and you cannot veer off course. We hold the line. Um, so let me then go to where, how does this come back to you and what are we gonna do about it? Because right? I promised you that. Um, the person to person defense of our democracy, short, medium and long term. The long term we already know and you know that academics will know, will have said this, there have been numerous reports, education. It's like everything. The medium term, the, the EU has taken this, it's legislation, it's necessary. Uh, the social media platforms, the technology companies are not going to do this voluntarily. There must be legislation and the EU is, is paving the way, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, too late for the Philippines, but you know, it kicks in spring next year. And then in the short term, in the short term, this is where it's person to person and where we can do much more together. This is where we have to figure out what civic engagement looks like in the age of <laughs> exponential propaganda, in the age of uh, a behavioral modification system that is our information highway. Right, so what is that? I have an example for you. We tried this in the Philippines, we didn't do it long enough. For our elections, we decided, and, and we worked with the Google News Initiative and with another uh, a tech-based kind of pipeline uh, called Midan, it's San Francisco-based, but look, it's a whole of society approach, that's what I wind up calling it, but it starts with, with this pyramid. So we started it really truly in February, because it took a few weeks to set up, but 16 news organizations working together for fact-checking. Fact-checking is really boring, right? And you used to think this was like implicit in everything a news organization does. On the internet, fact-checking is critical. So for the first time, these 16 news groups, nation nationwide and local, hyper-local news groups, we worked together. And it was fantastic to do that. Everything that we created was Creative Commons. Anyone can repurpose, anyone can repost. And then the second layer is the most important part. Because remember, fact checks are really boring. They don't spread on social media, which is how Filipinos get our news. So we created the mesh layer. Mesh, these are civil society groups, business groups, business finally joined, power and money's gotta come into this battle. Um, the church, Asia, um, the Philippines is Asia's largest Roman Catholic nation. Um, and what we did is we told the mesh, so Nobel Peace Center, for example, right? We told, we organized ourselves so that the mesh shares these fact checks and they add emotion because it's a thinking fast 
distribution system. It needs emotion, and we journalists aren't very good at that. <laughs> so Mesh, and look, it, it was actually really good. And I got the idea for Mesh. Did you guys watch that movie, Don't Look Up? You remember how the planetary system came together? Bit by bit by bit. Mesh, it was a mesh. It created a mesh before, to throw off the asteroid. Or, that's, so the mesh was the distribution system. And it, it worked. Anyway, the third part is research. If, if the first is to create truths, the second is to distribute, the third is to analyze. And we had, this is the first time, seven research groups came together with the data pipeline that we all could see, right? So the data pipeline brought that. And every week, we did a webinar where each, each research group would come out with their finding and tell our public, our, our people, who's doing what. What meta-narrative, what lie is being seeded? Who benefits from this? Who is the target? Um, so the research groups did that. They did, we did 21 research groups, uh, research papers. Um, and these are now all being peer-reviewed, but it, it, we reversed the academic cycle. Instead of peer review and then media, it was like, atomize it first, bring it to the public first, because you need to do that, and then it'll go to the peer reviews after. But, but we checked each other, right? So there's lots of stuff. That was incredible. 21 in like, from March to May. 21, that's pretty cool. And the last one, the one that's most important is the law. Where the heck are all the lawyers? Because impunity online is impunity offline, right? If there is no rule of law online, how do you expect our rule of law in the real world to survive? It hasn't. That is the erosion, right? So what happened here is that our legal groups in the Philippines came together and, and what they did is they filed more than 23 legal cases, <laughs> strategic and tactical litigation that helped protect the journalists who were being attacked, that helped protect the academics, because now history is under attack. So the academics are feeling the heat that the journalists have felt before. Um, this worked for a period of time, but not enough to stop the overwhelming win of a new Marcos, the namesake of our former dictator, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. He's our new president. Um, but it works. And how do I know it works? The impact it created. Within the first two weeks that we rolled this out, uh, the Solicitor General, the Office of the Solicitor General, filed a petition at the Supreme Court um, against Rappler and the Commission on Elections calling fact-checking illegal, saying that it is prior restraint. It's, we fought that also, and it, it's gone, but it was at the Supreme Court. So, all right, let me, I have less, okay, let me just come with the five lessons. Now, this is for you. I tell you, I just finished it. So, um, at the Nobel Lecture, I asked you, what will you sacrifice for the truth? And I realized that, you know, in writing this book, I wrote 400 pages that got edited down to 200. These are the lessons that I put in there. And... They may sound really naive, but you know, I think that's what the world needs. Remember when I pulled out the t-shirt that said, in order to be the good, you have to believe there is good in the world? That's the part that social media has taken away from us. That emergent human behavior that is coming out today emphasizes fear, anger, hatred. It, it, it makes us our worst selves. So remember these things. These are, this is what <laughs> I'm told by my publishers, I should say, inside the book, when you read the book, <laughs> in the book, um, I actually go through and show you the data behind all of this, right? But, you know, lesson number one for me is learn. You're here. Learn. This is a time when it seems like the world is falling apart, which it is. Um, but last night I was with a climate scientist who was optimistic. I think that's the most existential problem we face, and we cannot fix climate if we do not fix our information ecosystem, right? How can we get the right information to you? So learn. Um, the studies also show that the people in the middle, the people like us, uh, are the ones who are quiet. 
um, they said that the most extreme 6% are the ones that are, that are taking over the information ecosystem. So don't bury your head in the sand, right? The second, speak, speak. I was on the same stage where Salman Rushdie was attacked uh, in Chautauqua, New York. And, you know, it was a community that had it was a community that had been together for 149 years. And when I sat, it's like it seats 2,000, 3,000 people. And when I sat and spoke in front of the community, I had to face my fear because I was like, oh my gosh, how could that happen, right? It was in front of so many people that he was stabbed. And this is a man who dealt with a fatwa for speaking. Um, and Someone said, don't go, and I was like, mm, no, 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 we go. And, and I went, and I was so glad I did, because I could see a community that was shattered, but yet came back together, believed in the community, believed in the good. And it was fantastic to speak to them, because if you don't speak, you say everything is okay. Silence is consent. And now, at this time, you cannot, you can't be quiet. If something in your area of influence is wrong, this is the time to clean up our areas of influence. The third, you've heard me say a lot. Uh, I've been saying it since 2016. Draw the line where on this side you're good and on this side you're evil. It has to be that clear in your head because that's how you act because this is also a time to act, right? Um, the fourth is, this sounds naive again, we have to trust, because that's what's been broken. So each of us in our area of influence, even if our families are being torn apart, we trust. Our families are easier because we love. That's the other part, love, right? It's connected to this, but trust. What's being used to manipulate us is fear, anger, hate. Um, so think slow, not fast. Uh, us against them, when you run into that, and there are many ways to talk about that. It could be, it's now part of state ideology in Hungary. Um, it's moving in all different parts of the world. We need to avoid that. And Europe, more than any part of the world, understands what could happen when us against them is pushed to the nth grow, and to the nth point. We have to grow the shared reality. In the Nobel lecture, I talked about that shared reality being anchored by facts, right? And then finally, the last one, again, sounds crazy, but we have to have faith. I'm not a religious person, but more than at any other time, um, it's kind of connected. So I went, went back to this thing from the Bible. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's an empathy that can get lost. Again, on social media, so if you're not on social media, stay off. <laughs> Hi, Facebook live stream. <laughs> um, so, and then that last part, right? We will, these are my lessons. Just you, people ask me, how do you find the courage? It's in these five things. Because it's naturally not about fighting something. It's about holding the line on who you are who you want to be. And I think this is the part that is exciting. Everything is falling apart. The world is insane right now. Our politics, I already told you, 2024, please, please do something. Um, it's also exciting in a weird way because we're gonna create the world we want. And the world we want is actually better than where we are today. You know, that's what I think. So, please, you have to ask yourself the same question. What are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? That shared reality, because your courage will help determine our future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria.